Cool. Well, let's get started here. Um, I also Zoom also finally updated their um, their virtual backgrounds to the point where I can actually use a virtual background pretty well, and so I have a very useful one. I think I think that one's kind of fun. Um, but I think I like my whiteboard better. There was also now I'm just now I'm just showing off, um, but. I think I like I like that one too. All right, let's go ahead and start doing a little bit of review. All we're working on today is is more practice with these competing mechanisms where we're going to try and be able to isolate okay, what which of the mechanisms is going to be most favored under these conditions. Um, and this is your second to last lecture at this point. I think you're because we will have next week's Thanksgiving. The week after that is um, the week 11 of the quarter and then it's finals week. So week 11, I'm not going to lecture on new material on the third on that Thursday. Um, that's why I'm going to try to have your your exam. Um, ready to go for you and i i might i think last year i didn't do much of a take-home portion to it uh, i think i'm going to change that a little bit this year with it with everything being open book um and give you a section that's that's timed like the midterm and then a section that's you basically have a whole week to work on that'll be a little bit of the, the ir and the nmr and i think your last new lecture will be one more lab technique um that's um Although I might just, well, watch watch for an announcement. I'll get all everybody's papers posted there that are they're presenting in two weeks, um, and I'll have some information in there about what we're gonna do in week eleven. We may not, I may just give you guys that morning, um, not next Tuesday but the Tuesday after to keep prepping for your. Um, for your research project for your journal club presentations and uh, and the test. Um, so let me we'll see how far we get today, I guess, is part of that are, too. Are you are you gonna do a practice midterm just out of curiosity? There'll be some form of study guide. Um, mm -hmm. depends on with the timing this year, I should have time to get you a, a full practice test. Um, but at the very least, they'll I'll have a list of like these are the topics you need to study and it'll be pretty closely matched to what's on the test. Not um, not like one of those giant study guides that's where you have no idea there's you know three pages, a single space of topics that you have to study and I'm gonna pick three of them. Um, it'll be pretty closely matched to, to what you'll see on the, on the test. Okay. Um, but I'm not gonna tie myself into doing a practice test exactly just because of the I don't know what the format of the test is going to look like and I don't know what my my time is going to look like so I will have something for you though all right let's do another draw all the possible products all the possible mechanisms for this molecule here you might want to start with the simplest mechanism being the concerted substitution is only going to give you one product, right? So you might want to start with that and then maybe do the second version of substitution, which would be the, the two-step SN1 process.
I'm going to give you guys a few more minutes to try it before I start going through it and talking. So for our simplest reaction, got our reactant here on the left. I suppose if I'm already drawing the reactant for you, we don't need, need to have it displayed. Um, these, if it's a strong base, let's say it's hydroxide, and we're trying to draw all the um, substitution and elimination products. The first, oops, forgot my methyl group there. If it goes through an SN2 reaction, if it goes through the concerted substitution reaction, all we're gonna do, that's the backside attack where we're going to, where our hydroxide is just going to come in here And the negative or a pair of a lone, one of the lone pairs is going to come in here and attack that carbon. And this chlorine is going to leave simultaneously. It has to attack from the opposite side as the chlorine. So it's attack if the chlorine is sticking out towards us, the hydroxide is going to attach from behind the molecule, behind the screen. So our product is going to look like this, and really an OH, but we're just drawing skeletal structures. So that would be our SN1 product. Sorry, I'm so sorry. That's our SN2 product. It always seems backwards because we covered SN2 first and it's concerted. Remember the two stands for second order or bimolecular. You need both of these things to run into each other at the same time um, in order for this to happen. So the SN2 is happening all at once. <clears throat> what is our product going to be if we go through an SN1, if the first thing that happens is leaving group leaves. Get a carbocation. We'll get a carbocation. So let's start by drawing our carbocation. Nothing is moved. yet, but we have that as our intermediate. So if the hydroxide just attacked right now, we would get a, about a 50-50 mixture of the molecule we just made for SN2 and the enantiomer, the mirror image where the hydroxide is sticking out at us because this carbocation, the secondary carbocation, is totally flat and planar. So that hydroxide can come in and attach from either side, top or bottom. However, we can make this carbocation more stable first, right? Carbocations 
can go through rearrangement. That was one of our four mechanism steps, our four basic mechanism steps, the rearrangement. And we really have two options here. Our two possibilities for rearrangement are either methyl shift or a hydride shift. Whatever happens, we need to make our carbocation more stable. So if it's secondary, we either have to go to secondary with resonance or tertiary. Or tertiary with resonance would be the most stable carbocation you could have. We're secondary right now. Could we move a single hydrogen or methyl to make it a tertiary carbocation? Yeah, we could move a hydride or a methyl, right? And make it, we're not gonna move this methyl on the right-hand side because then we're still gonna be left with a secondary carbocation over here. We've got, but we've got a quaternary carbon next to it, which means we could move one of these methyls over and put a positive charge here, or we could move the hydrogen and make a tertiary carbocation on the right-hand side. Which one's going to be more likely? Moving the hydrogen because it's smaller? Moving the hydrogen because it's smaller. If you're, if, uh, you're trying to park a car in your driveway and you can choose to move three inches of snow or you can choose to... Um, push a rusty tractor out of the way by hand to make room for your car, which one's easier? Shovel three inches of snow, right? Smaller thing is easier to move, which means it happens faster. Which means if we're picking between two options, between a methyl and a hydride, it's not really an option to pick the methyl. You only do a methyl shift as a last resort if there's no hydrogen that you could shift to make it tertiary instead. which is in fact what we're gonna see here. So we will wind up with the hydrogen's electrons moving into that empty P orbital of the carbocation and dragging the hydrogen along with it. And that leaves the positive charge on that tertiary carbon on the right-hand side. And now we don't have to worry about stereochemistry here at this point, right? Because carbocations are planar. They have that unoccupied P orbital, so they're totally flat, which means no R and S anymore. It flattens out. And as a result, we will wind up with a different set of products. Emily? Was that a question or were you just, okay. Looked like you raised your hand. Um, so when we come back and add the hydroxide to it, here's our product. Do we need to worry about stereochemistry now? we made another asymmetric carbon. We started with two asymmetric carbons. One of them, the first one flattened out, but then we did the methyl, the hydride shift and the second carbo or the stereo center flattened out to lose its, its uh, stereochemistry. But then we turned around and we made a carbon that had four different things attached to it again. So with that in mind, are we going to favor one of the isomers versus the other? Our two possibilities would look like this.
if I try to add the hydrogen right now, it's going to wind up trying to attach one of these. So that's still the hydroxide. I'm just not drawing the hydrogen for this bottom one. So either your hydroxide attaches from the bottom and pushes the methyl up, or your hydroxide attaches from the top and pushes the methyl down. Right, because we started with this methyl being totally flat with the positive charge on the tertiary carbon. Is one of these favored over the other? Or are they going to be equally likely? I think they're going to be equally likely. They're going to be equally likely, exactly. Right, so because the um, because the transition state is fully, or sorry, the intermediate is fully planar, our SN1 products, we're gonna get a 50-50 mixture of R and S of these two possibilities. And are those, wait, you said those are R and S? Correct. Okay. I don't I don't know which is which, but I know one of them's R and one of them's S. So benefits of being a 50-50 choice, right? Sean, I have a question about that. Yeah. In the book, it says that it still um, prefers backside attack, even though there's like the carbocation. Is it like only like one per like 51, 49, or is it just so negligible that you'd still just say 50-50? So what, what you're probably seeing there is the small contribution, a small contribution of the SN2 reaction. The SN2 will favor the backside attack every time. If we had a way of 100% every single time, think we absolutely in no way will we ever have an SN2. Um, we will almost certainly see it. It'll still be really, really close to 50-50. You might, where, where you might see some of that happen, um, happen is when it does that shift and then your methyl goes from being from being um, sticking into the board to being planar, it might not have a chance depending on your concentrations of your hydroxide um, to go all the way to being planar before the hydroxide finds the carbocation and reacts with it. So that's that's probably the other contributor to it, it'll favor doing the backside attack at least a little bit now because that would that would actually favor the front side attack then. Um, so it's probably what the book is referring to is that small contribution of SN2, even if it's a tertiary carbon. Right, that would make sense. All right, so substitution. We've got two possibilities, two mechanism possibilities that would give us three total products. And that, and the substitution reactions are a little bit simpler that way. You generally only get one or two um, products from each of those mechanisms because we're only involving one carbon at a time, really, right? We might have a rearrangement happening, but for the most part, you're only gonna wind up with one carbon actually changing. So the elimination where we're involving the alpha carbon and the beta carbon can wind up being having more possible products sometimes, right? We're still gonna favor one product usually, but because there's more ways of combining it, um, it's a little bit more complicated. So, since we just did the SN1 and went through that carbocation, SN2's carbocation intermediate is going to look the same, right? It's the same first two steps in this case for E1 as for SN1. The first step would be leaving group leaves, puts a positive charge here. And then the second step would be that hydride migration where this flattens out and you wind up with 
this intermediate. So if it's going to go through an E1 mechanism, we're going to start here. And now this is our alpha carbon. Because this is going to be carbon one of the alkene. So the beta carbons shift when you do your rearrangement, right? Because the carbocation carbon has to be one of the two pieces of the alkene. So our beta carbons then would be those three carbons. And is one of them going to be favored over Yeah, if, if hydroxides are base, it's not one of our odd cases of sterically hindered base, which means we follow the Zaitsev's rule. We get the normal product, the more stable product, which is more substituted alkene. So our, we have three possibilities that will all give us different alkenes, and some of which will give us cis versus trans. So we're actually going to wind up with five different products. If I'm doing that right, if I'm counting right in my head. Because we're going to get a, we're not going to get a E versus Z product when we make the primary alkene here, right? Because this top methyl group is going to wind up having two hydrogens attached to it. So no cis and trans. Beta carbon to the right. We'll, ha we'll have a cis and trans because you'll have a big a methyl group versus this big bulky group and a methyl group versus a hydrogen. And then when we make the bond to the left-hand beta carbon, we'll also have cis and trans because we'll have an ethyl versus a methyl on one side and we'll have a t-butyl versus a hydrogen on the other side. All right, so let, let's try and draw those. So there's your first product. That's making the pi bond to the alpha carbon to the left. And does that one have cis and trans? You bet. And in the interest of condensing things, I made those too close. And so the other one would look like, I said still too close. Not that. So our pi bond is here. I switched the methyl and the ethyl on the right hand side. And I kept the t-butyl where it was. And, and which one's cis and which one's trans? So cis and trans rolls off the tongue a little bit easier and it's easier to understand what I'm saying. So I say that, but really we would name it with E and Z. Where e is the opposite and Z is on the same side. Um, and we would say that the, um, the group that has priority on the left would be the T-butyl group. The group that has priority on the right would be the ethyl group. So that means that we would have that the top one would be the E stereoisomer and the bottom one would be the Z stereoisomer.
even when all of this is seeming very overwhelming and confusing, at least nomenclature hasn't changed, right? You know, adding pieces to it, but for the most part, nomenclature is a safety blanket. It's like stoichiometry of the of the OCHEM world. You can always rely on stare, of nomenclature to be there. <clears throat> all right, if we look at the other alpha carbon here, So that was this alpha carbon. Now, if we look at the top alpha carbon, we're only going to get one product, right? And it's going to look like that. All right? No E or Z, no cis and trans because one side of the alkene has two identical substituents attached to it. Our last option, let me rearrange a little bit and uh, move our substitution products around. Our last product would be two products, E and Z products would be if we made the pi bond to the right-hand side. So for that, we'd see uh, we wind up with the pi bond here. There's one product. The other would be with the methyl at the end switched. And I almost always have to do some erasing when I have to, when I draw the um, isomer that's that's the uh, the E isomer um, because I almost always default to alternating like this the Z um, stereoisomer would look like this. All right, so I just switched the methyl at the end. Sorry, that you said that C, the one you that just did? That would be the Z because the, the big bulky group on the left hand side has priority and the meth out of a methyl and a hydrogen the methyl has priority so these i'm sorry which one z the bottom one is z the bottom one. okay the and can you just can you go over again how you're you're i know you're saying like the big bulky group um so if you don't if you don't move the big bulky group, can you just explain that? That you mean the priority? Uh, yeah, how to determine E and Z. So you're always going to look at both sides of your alkene and mm -hmm. say and um and say okay for the left hand carbon, I have to decide which is more important, the bottom one or the top. Mm -hmm. And and then so that's what I mean by priorities one and two and that's we use the same as the as R and S we use the atomic numbers and then a tiebreaker go out one bond each step for a tiebreaker mm -hmm. and then we do the same thing for the other side we have a hydrogen is our other substituent attached here mm -hmm. um, and so assigning priority would look like the methyl group is going to be higher priority than the hydrogen would be. Mm -hmm. And so the two substituents that have the highest priority okay. are on the same side of the double bond. OK, that makes a lot of sense. So basically, if you can draw, if you can draw a circle and get both number ones, 
without mm -hmm. drawing a circle around the pi bond, mm -hmm. then that means that it must be Z. They must be on the same side. Okay. If you try to draw your priority, um, a circle around your higher priority substituents and it goes across the pi bond, mm -hmm. then it's got to be E. So you just have to be kind of careful when you're drawing your hydrogens, I guess. Um, yes, where you're drawing your hydrogens and just knowing that even if I only have one thing drawn on one side, that the hydrogens are still there. Mm -hmm. It's like for this, the example at the bottom, oops, um, for this product, we have two hydrogens attached to the top carbon here. Mm -hmm. And which means we have two identical things attached, which means there is no E and Z. Because if we switch those two hydrogens, we get the same molecule we started with. Okay. And that's that's how you know that there's a flip kind of in the molecule. That there's a stereoisomer, yeah. Okay. Okay. It's it's just like count if determining if there's R and S, you look for a carbon that has four different things attached to it. Mm -hmm. To determine if there's E and Z, both of your alkene carbons need to have two different things attached. So you don't need four unique substituents, but each of the carbons involved has to have two unique substituents. All right. Well, we are adding some products in there, right? It's easy to see why um, one of the uh, Gen Chem students, we're doing percent yield in Gen Chem and stoichiometry right now. And one of the Gen Chem students on their quiz question last week asked, well, why, why don't we get 100% yield ever? This is why we get, never get 100% yield. Because even if you can favor one mechanism, you've got six other possible products that are being made at the same time. At best, you get something like 90, 95% yield. If you're really careful and it's a simple reaction, you might get up into the high 90s. So, Sean, I kind of have a question about that. Yeah. Um, so, in terms of, so our, our, uh, our uh, nucleophile was um, hydroxide this time. So, that's a strong base, strong nuke you're asking for all of them like i thought basically are all these actually happening but just some of them are just on such a small level that we don't consider them or it's like i wouldn't expect there to be any e1 or e or uh, sn1 for this reaction based off of our conditions um you are you are correct we would not expect much if any sn1 or e1 um and, and so when i see it none not much, if any, we're still talking about such large numbers that even if SN2 and E2 happen a million times faster, if you have a, an entire mole of reactants, that's six times 10 to the 23rd, right? And a million is only 10 to the six. So you're still gonna wind up with a, maybe not a significant amount, but if you were really, really careful and set, you know, if you took a GC of everything at the end and got, were really, really careful and separated everything out, you'd wind up with trace amounts of these other products um, because they are still happening. They're just happening so slow relative to the others. Um, but when we're dealing with numbers as large as a mole or even a millimole, that's still going to be um, a big enough number we will see these really un or unlikely reactions happen at least a little bit. Okay, um, yeah, that makes so much more sense. Like, okay, remember, I, I, um, I don't know if I, if I mentioned it in this class this year yet. Um, but remember, Interstellar's definition of Murphy's law. It's my favorite definition of chemistry. Is whatever can happen does happen. These other things can happen, so they do happen, even if it's just a little bit. Gotcha. Yeah, I think the idea of rates, um, I guess it's, I'm not sure if it's just because human versus uh, molecular, but like, yeah, there's, it's, it's harder to grasp uh, quickly, you know. 
Yeah, and and these rates they, 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 these rates do vary so dramatically, but when we're talking about something as big as an entire mole, those those tiny tiny amounts are still going to wind up being just barely measurable, and only if you're really really careful usually. You know, if you get ninety eight percent, ninety nine percent yield, um, you're that other one percent is going to be a mixture of all the other possibilities and you know those are still going to be hard to then separate out because you you're then taking one percent of your total product and then trying to divide it up into six different compounds that were in there those are all going to be really tiny percentages of each of them but they add up to a measurable amount usually and that's not even taking into account the fact that, th that these are all equilibrium reactions too, meaning it doesn't go, even if none of these other things happen, we still wouldn't go to 100% because we have some leftover reactants because of that equilibrium. All right, last, last part here. E2, E2 we don't have, The carbocation intermediate. E2 was our concerted elimination reaction. Where we're, we have our leaving group leaving at the same time as our base pulls a hydrogen off here. And that means we need to make sure that there is a hydrogen that can leave. Right? And what the stereochemistry will look like when it does leave. So for the E2, this, this molecule meets our criteria of where we had to be very careful, right? If two chiral carbons next to each other, the alpha carbon and the beta carbon are both asymmetric carbons. They both have R and S which means we've got to look at that Newman projection or look at that way of drawing it where we get the hydrogen and the chlorine have to be 180 degrees from each other for this to happen. All right, and so I'm gonna to switch to drawing on the board for this. So if we have this molecule being drawn, I'm going to draw it the same way we have it drawn right now. So we have the chlorine coming out towards us, a hydrogen going away, and then a T-butyl group. And that's the left-hand stereo center. And then the right hand stereo center, we have the a hydrogen coming out towards us up top, a methyl going away from us up top, and an ethyl down into the right. So all I've done so far was take the molecules we started with rotate it so that the bond where the where the alkene is going to form is horizontal. I haven't moved anything else yet. You guys see that? And then I zoomed in and drew these two carbons. If we if this is going to go through an E2, this fluorine and this hydrogen have to be 180 degrees from each other. Right, in order to get that, to give the base room to pull the hydrogen off and to get, we have to have these electrons that are gonna make the pi bond have to be in the same plane as the electrons that are leaving in order for the orbitals to line up and overlap properly. 
you need them to be that 180 degrees from each other. And so if we want to see what that's going to look like as far as the stereo center, stereo isomer that we're going to get, we need to rotate these so that the hydrogen is flat and pointed 180 degrees from the chlorine. So the way it's drawn now, the way I would approach this is do each of these do a, a fan rotation, spin the left-hand side, keep the right-hand side the same, and then do the opposite. So I'm going to keep the right-hand side the same for now, and I'm going to spin the left-hand side to put the chlorine where the t-butyl group is. And so that's going to put the hydrogen, the hydrogen on the alpha carbon. The hydrogen on the alpha carbon is going to be pointed out towards us now. The t-butyl group is down and into the board. And our hydrogen sorry, chlorine is up and to the left and flat. So for the ease of drawing these and seeing that they're going to be planar, um, I always like to keep the leaving group and the hydrogen being flat. You can do that with them being one of them sticking out and then the other one being into the board. It's just harder to see it visually. So I always rearrange it this way. Then on the right hand side, we need the hydrogen to be where the ethyl is, which puts the ethyl in the back and the methyl where the hydrogen is. And so just to be clear, the alpha carbon is the alpha carbon because it has the T-butyl group or no, it has the chlorine, okay. Yeah, it has the leaving group on it. Once we get it arranged this way, getting it drawn the right way and remembering that they have to be in the same plane is the trickiest part because once we get it drawn this way, draw the mechanism, chlorine leaves, part hydroxide comes in here and attacks. The hydrogen, hydrogen's electrons move over. But really what we're going to have happen is everything gets flat. Your leaving group leaves, the hydrogen's gone. And what's left over is going to flatten out and to become two planar carbons, right? Because now both carbons are sp2. So everything that was sticking up and into the board and out of the board just moves down. Everything over here just flattens out as well. Right, and so that limits what our possible stereoisomers can be. If it goes E2, we're only gonna get one stereoisomer in this case. And it's going to be the stereoisomer that looks like, and we draw it flat now. Uh, so the, and then I'll switch to a skeletal structure. T-butyl, hydrogen, ethyl, methyl. So I flattened it out and then turned it 90 degrees so that we could look at it from the top. which means our stereochemistry would look, or our skeletal structure would look like that. With the T-butyl and the ethyl on the same side. So we will only get the Z stereoisomer.
right? Because it has to be, you, you have to align up your leaving group and your hydrogen in order to make them flat. Though the leaving group and the hydrogen have to be met, um, in the same plane, they have to be 180 degrees from each other in order to make the alkene. Right? And again, think about all the products that we drew first from the E1 mechanism and the substitution that all made more sense. If this is what you're getting hung up on, remember that this is just one out of the four mechanisms and this is the exception rather than the rule that we have to worry about this because this only happens if your alpha and your beta carbon are chiral, are asymmetric centers. So most of the time you don't need to worry about this. And so just to remind you guys that this is very the, a niche of, of substitution and elimination. All right, so you guys were not given enough information to decide which of the um, mechanisms is going to be favored. Because I it just said, if you treat it with a strong base, it says nothing about solvent. It doesn't say what the strong base is. So you can't say SN1 is more likely S than E1 necessarily. Um, but within all of those different mechanisms, we can rank, say, okay, if it just went SN1, which of these is going to be most likely, or are they equally likely, which we kind of already did for the substitutions. Right, so for our substitutions, if it was SN1, we're going to get a 50-50 mixture of the two stereoisomers, maybe slightly favoring the backside attack, which would be the, the top. Um, if it goes SN2, we only get one possibility. SN2 will only ever give you one product. If you start with a specific stereoisomer, you're going to get the inverted form of it because you have to do the backside attack. So 50-50 mixture, only one product. That's easy to rank the products then, right? And there's only one of them. E2, again, only one product, so we don't have to rank anything. Out of the E1 products, how could we rank these? or more substituted in the major? Yeah, so even without worrying about deciding deciding on E versus Z, we know that this is our most substituted. Actually, that's equally substituted to the ones on the right, isn't it? We wind up with a tri-substitute alkene in both cases. So those are gonna be about equally likely. And our least likely product would be this alkene here. Sean, would you consider sterics at all? You would. Um, so I'm gonna try to not ask you too many splitting hairs questions while we're still getting our feet under with you with this. Um, so I would not ask you to rank, if all four of these are tri-substituted alkenes, I'm not going to ask you to rank these four relative to each other. And with, but within each of these possibilities, we would just look at the sterics to say, okay, the, um, the more likely, I had to make sure that we didn't need to worry about the number of alpha, alpha or beta hydrogens. Um, we would just look at the one, the stereoisomer that puts the big groups opposite from each other. So usually that's the, the E 
stereoisomer is going to be favored. Hey, Sean, I got a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, so then if we're talking about the left side where you have the top one where it's the E is circled, correct? Mm -hmm. So then will the E always be more favored then because Z would be the same side. So there's like, they're bumping into each other. So they'd rather go to the E so that they're not bumping into each other. Usually, yes. Okay. You can have cases where your higher priority is not the bigger in terms of sterics. Okay. For instance, if you had um, a methyl that had an OH attached to it, that would be higher priority than a T butyl group, but a T butyl group is bigger. Okay. So usually, and again, while you're just trying to learn the, the general trends, you could make that generalization that E is going to be favored unless your higher priority substituent is not the largest. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. Um, but when all we're dealing with is carbons, when everything that we're talking about is a carbon, then we don't need to worry about the um, different atomic numbers throwing that off. And you can, you can make that generalization that the Z is going to be less common. E is going to be more common because that puts your bigger groups on opposite sides. So that would be those two, the two that I circled in blue. I keep referring to things in colors. Nobody in here is colorblind, are they? I would really be losing my dad if I was trying to explain this using colors and saying things like the blue one. It, uh, it really scared me when I was in college and I was driving with my dad and like, and we were, I think we were in Mexico or something and the traffic lights were sideways and he had, I had to tell him when it turned to green because he didn't know which side was red and which side was green and he couldn't tell the difference. He knew the middle was yellow, but that was it. Um, I didn't realize that for my whole life I would ridden in cars with him and he didn't, couldn't tell a red light from a green light. The things you learn about your parents when you get older, right? All right, let's take a break here. Let's come back at 10 after, and then we'll get into some of the splitting hairs about how do we decide which mechanism we use. Come back at 10 after. Is it dash colorblind? No, um, it's. It, so it's a, it's a sex linked trait. So it's on the Y chromosome. And so you can only get it. It won't skip a generation and you can only get it from your father directly. And you have a 50, 50 shot. Um, Looks like you and Dash looked up. We did. And my brother too. I don't know. Yeah. One in four chance and both me and my brother didn't get it. So um, no, it, uh, it actually follows those Punnett square rules for biology really, really carefully and it can only come from one side so it's not even a punnett square it's just a 50 50 coin flip if your if your dad has it for red green color blindness true color blindness might be more complicated it might be on a different spot in your genome i don't know about has that i've ever tried those uh, glasses that are supposed to like correct it i'm tr we talked about getting him those for christmas a year a year or two ago. I don't know if we did because he got LASIK. He's worn glasses his whole life and he got LASIK. Um, and so I think, oh. we, I think he decided to do that rather than get the, um, because that's more of a headache to put on glasses or contacts every day than it is to worry about, can I see red and green? He's never yeah, been Yeah, congratulations on LASIK. We bought you glasses for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. He wouldn't have worn them anyway. Um, but I have to, I haven't, I don't know if he's tried them or not. I'll have to ask him. Yeah, I'd just be curious to, to see what that experience was like for him to be like, whoa, this is what it looks like. Yeah, remind me, I'll, uh, um, my my parents are, are up here, so I'll have to, next time I see him, I'll have to ask, um, ask him if I remember. So ask me again after Thanksgiving. All right. <laughs>
All right. So go ahead and start bringing it back here. We just put this back, this slide back up again to remind our, us of our um, our primary considerations when we're trying to decide what mechanism something will go through. Is if you're deciding if it's first order or second order. Our primary considerations are, is it tertiary or not? Because we're, we're basically, the only time we're going to favor a first order reaction is with a tertiary, a leaving group on a tertiary carbon. And then that's also where solvent effects come in. So usually we're looking at second order reactions. SN2E2, the concerted all at once reactions. If we're in a polar protic solvent, we can switch to favoring the first order reactions. Or if it's a tertiary carbocation that we would be making, we can favor the first order reactions. Beyond that, we're almost always going to see second order reactions. They're far more common than first order reactions, partly because we only get, we get fewer products. And so we, in OCHEM lab, um, we tend to arrange things and use solvents such that we can, allows us to ignore the first order reactions. We usually, we don't, usually want SN1 or E1 to happen because we get that those big old messes of different products as opposed to just one product or just two products. All right, so um, unless the reaction's happening in water, unless it's tertiary, we can usually rely on that. And then again, the pull up that other figure there, that cheat sheet from WVU, which is West Virginia University. The the two best um, universities for organic chemistry, not as far as the research goes, but as far as finding really good um, figures, happen to be University of Wisconsin and West Virginia University. I don't know why that is, other than they're people working in those two schools that make good figures. Um, so this one had a little bit more detail. And that if it's secondary, you this one has the, the splitting hairs definitions, right? So SN1 and E1, you can favor it with a weak nucleophile and weak base. And then we can also have temperature play a role in this a little bit as well. We'll go why that, go over why that is. Um, for instance, you favor um, you favor elimination at high temperatures, and you favor substitution at low temperatures. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but the secondary, the benzylic and the allylic, meaning benzylic means that you're one carbon away from a benzene ring. Allylic means you're one carbon away from a pi bond. Those are going to be, this is the case where we can have a little wiggle room where if we tweak it just right, we can get it to go SN1 or E1. If we pick the right solvent, if we pick the right nucleophile. If it's primary, it's never SN1 or E1. If it's tertiary, it's never SN2. You can kind of, you can get it to go E2 with a strong enough base because you don't need access to that active carbon. Um, but, and the secondary carbons are the tricky ones where there's wiggle room. All right, so let's, let's talk about why that is. Um, here's another practice drawing all of the reactions problem. Um, we'll save that for right now, since we just did one of those. So the there are a couple ways we can 
break down how we can split these reactions up. Um, the, the most obvious, the simplest way is to look at, is it a first order reaction or a second order reaction? Because the first order reactions have a lot of things in common with each other. They're all going through that carbocation intermediate, which means we're going to favor first order reactions with similar, um, similar conditions. Second order reactions are favored with similar conditions to each other as well. So substitution and elimination seems like the obvious way to break these up, but really first order versions versus second order versions is a little bit more descriptive um, if you have SN2 happening, you probably also have a little bit of, of E2. You might not have any SN1 or E1, but those second order reactions can happen under similar conditions. Right? Because strong bases also tend to be strong nucleophiles. Doing it in nonpolar or aprotic solvents is going to favor those second order reactions as well. And so it's going to favor both the substitution second order and the elimination second order at the same time. If you do it in a real in a polar protic solvent, if you have weak bases and weak nucleophiles, and at low concentrations, you're going to favor first order. And then once we decide, is it first order or second order? we can decide between is it um, substitution or elimination, right? And really, again, likely both of those are happening at the same time, but we can favor the substitution over the elimination or vice versa if we are careful about conditions. Why would concentration play a role here? What does low concentration do to a reaction? I would imagine it would happen slower, maybe? Slower. Yeah, exactly. And so if it's happening slower, is, is changing the concentration going to affect how fast the, the leave, how likely the leaving group is to leave on its own. Not really, right? That's just based on there's, let's just call it a, a one in 10 chance every second. Every, let's say that a molecule has a one in 10 chance of, of the leaving group leaves on its own. That's not really affected by how much concentration you have, right? Every molecule has the same likelihood of that happening. And if if that's your rate determining step, then the next step is gonna happen much faster. So at low concentrations, you favor the first order reactions because that leaving group is gonna leave at approximately the same rate every time. It like the half-life of a, of a um, radioactive material. It doesn't matter what, how much of that radioactive material you have, the half-life is the same, right? If it's a second order reaction, you need these two things to bump into each other in order for this to happen. And then decreasing your concentrations is going to exponentially decrease the odds that they bump into each other. So it's not so much that we make the first order reactions faster at low concentrations. It's just that low concentrations make the second order reactions much slower. Right? So first order reactions are usually going to happen slower than second order reactions, but we can slow down the second order reactions enough to let the first order take over. Um, if we're trying to decide between substitution and elimination within these, if we've already decided, okay, I think it's second order because it's a primary alkyl halide. 
or I think it's going to be first order because we're in we're doing this reaction in ethanol, which is a protic solvent. The what decides the difference between substitution versus elimination is frequently how act how much access to the alpha carbon do we have? And that's where you, the sterics play a role, right? If you if you think it's going to be first order, but you your base can't get in there to actually attach to the carbocation, the base is still unstable either way. It's trying to attach to a positive charge either way. And so if that if it can't get to the carbocation, it'll just grab a proton instead and you get elimination happening. Right? So changing what your base is versus is going to affect substitution versus elimination. If there's steric hindrance, that's going to favor elimination because those sterically hindered bases, or if there's steric hindrance on the, the molecule that has the leap that had the leaving group, those are going to be much more likely to go through elimination than substitution because your nucleophile can't actually get in there and attach to a carbon. So it just grabs a hydrogen and calls it good enough. And so small bases will favor substitution. Hydroxide favors substitution over elimination. Almost always. The larger your base gets, the more it'll favor elimination. And the more spinach you get around the active carbon, the more you'll favor elimination as well. So let's try this. We've got a reaction happening. We've got a tertiary alkyl halide reacting with a strong base, strong nucleophile. And again, I don't expect you to have that memorized yet, um, but you might want to, if you're, when you're prepping for your test or in your notes, you might want to make yourself a table of these are my strong bases, strong nucleophiles. These are strong base, weak nucleophiles. These are weak base, weak nucleophiles. And the there you can have a weak base, strong nucleophile as well. We're doing, if we do this reaction in a solvent, it just says C6H12, which means we don't know exactly what the solvent is, but we know it's nonpolar, right? Because there's no oxygens or nitrogens involved. So this is hexane. And actually frequently we'll, we will use a solvent in, in OCHEM lab that's just called hexanes, plural. Um, and that's that's a comp that's a mixture of compounds that all have have C the same formula. They're all C6H12, and it's just basically a mixture of all the different isomers of C6H12. Because when you refine petroleum, you refine it by boiling point, and all of the C6H12 isomers have approximately the same boiling point. So rather than take that and then further separate it out into methyl pentane versus hexane versus dimethyl butane, um, they just package it all up and call it hexanes, plural. So C6H12 is a really common solvent for that reason. It's also a common component of gasoline. Um, all that's telling us is this is a nonpolar solvent, which means are we going to expect this to go through, through first order or second order? Let's look at our cheat sheet. It's tertiary, which means we definitely are not going SN2 with a strong enough, with a strong base though, we can still have it go E2. 
especially in a nonpolar solvent, because a nonpolar solvent is not going to stabilize that carbocation intermediate, right? You can't make any favorable interactions between hexane and a carbocation. There's no partial negative on the hexane that you can donate, that you can surround the positive charge with, right? So in a nonpolar solvent, we're going to favor second order reactions. Tertiary, we would normally say favors um, first order reactions, but because it's in a nonpolar solvent and we have a strong base, we're going to favor the second order reaction in this case. And then, and if we go back to the other um, graph here, so tertiary carbocation, it's a strong base and strong nucleophile. You get E2 as our favored mechanism. You need it to be a weak base in order to favor the second order. Basically, especially in a nonpolar solvent, um, you need to give your reactant time for the leaving group to leave. If you have a strong base or a strong nucleophile, it's almost always going to get in there and react quickly, which means you're not going to give your alkyl halide enough time for the leaving group to leave. All right, so we would, ex we would expect this to be second order, but it can't be SN2 because this, this ammonia can't get access to that carbon. There's too much other stuff around. So what it'll do instead, if you can't get to the active carbon, amide is still a really, really good base. It's really, really unstable. It's gonna steal a proton somewhere. So what we see instead is that amide comes in and grabs one of the hydrogens from a beta carbon. And you make the alkene. All right, so one of our products would be ammonia and then we would need chlorine would be leaving and taking its electrons with it. So one of our products will be NH3, just the protonated form of our base. One of our products would be chloride. And then we're gonna have a mixture of the possible elimination products. This is a beta carbon here, but it's not a beta carbon that can go through elimination right, because there's no hydrogens on it to give up. Plus, if we made, if we did make a double bond there, it wouldn't be able to resonate with the with the benzene ring, right, because it would be directly attached to it. So instead, putting putting our pi bond, one bond away from the benzene ring is usually going to be favor favorable, because that allows for a lot of resonance. But both of our other beta carbons will give us that resonance. So we might make that molecule would be if if we reacted, well, let's color code these. If we reacted with the red beta carbon, we'll make this product. Is there an E or Z? One side of the pi bond is you got two identical substituents, right? So you can't tell the difference between those two hydrogens. The other possibility be the ethyl group and 
and that's not supposed to be a double bond there at the top. That was just a careless bond being drawn. Or Is Pavo Turkey in, in Spanish? Okay. I hear my brother or my brother, my son yelling about Pavo in the in the next room over and with Thanksgiving coming up. I thought so. Pato is doc, right? With a T. Okay. It's been a long time since I've taken a Spanish class, but it's all coming back as my son is is uh, at Bijou here and learning Spanish. He's correcting my grammar all the time now, which is kind of nice. So Sean, um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm still having a hard time with um, just the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. The nucleophile, the strong nucleophile is referring to the C6H12 or the chlorine? So the chlorine is the leaving group. Okay. The nucleophile and the base are the same molecule. That it's it's that we're talking about the same thing. If I say the base, I also it's also the nucleophile. Okay, well, because just in that chart you showed us, it said it has a strong base and strong nucleophile. The one from like Wisconsin, mm -hmm. the other one. Yeah, other one. right. Or I guess yeah, that one. Or maybe no, no, no. You're right. It was that other one. So, on. so every every different nucleophile is mm -hmm. also a base. But just because it's a strong nucleophile does not necessarily make it a strong base and vice versa. So when we say strong nucleophile, strong base, we're talking about the same molecule. Is it both a strong nucleophile and a strong base? Okay. Okay, so, so the nucleophile. So I'm, I feel pretty good with bases, like referring to something as a base, but so the nucleophile is just what's pulling the electrons or no, what's willing to give up its electrons. Right, so nucleophiles have extra electrons usually, it might not have a negative charge, but it has at least a partial negative and a lone pair. Um, and so the, the difference between a base and a nucleophile is we, if we talk about it as a base, we, we mean it's going to be pulling a proton away from something else. If we talk about it as a nucleophile, we're talking about it attaching to a carbon instead okay. carbons carbons that have good leaving groups also tend to be either positive or partially positive just like hydrogens are and so a strong base is frequently also a strong nucleophile and we would we would just change whether we call it a nucleophile or a base depending on whether the reaction has it attaching to a, a hydrogen or has it attaching to a carbon okay okay that makes sense okay Thank you. No problem. All right, so in this case, amide, NH2 with a negative charge is acting as a base. If we had it coming in here and attaching to the carbon and doing a substitution reaction, we would call it a nucleophile. Mm -hmm. Good question. Which of these three is going to be most favored? So it's more substituted, which means it's the Zaitsev product. And this is the Z stereoisomer. Sorry, this is the E stereoisomer that puts them on opposite sides. And then deciding between these, which is least favored, is going to be a little bit tricky because these they're going to be close to the same amount if it's going to depend on probably with this small of a 
um, base, we will probably favor making the more substituted alkene about like nine, nine to one, probably 90% of it is this and 10% is over here, which means our second favored product, our middle product, the major of the minors. We call it our, our quadruple A player. It's on the bubble between the majors and the minors. Um, would probably be this one. It gets a little bit tricky because if we say, okay, 90% of our product is this, and then 60% of that 90% is the top one, that means that this one might be getting down to close to the same level as our other minor product. So it gets a little bit trickier to say out of these two, which is the least likely. Um, but it it's still pretty easy to say, okay, well, I know it's one of the blue ones is gonna be the major product. And then I can pick between those two, which is the major product. So figuring out the major product is always easier than figuring out the order of the minor products. So on a test, I will usually ask you just what's the major product, um, unless it's got a really clear ordering of as far as which one would go next, which would be the next most likely. And we we chose the the E product because the it's like more evenly distributed. One side is not heavier than the other, or has more priority than the other. We picked it because the two biggest groups, the big group on each side, is pointing in opposite direction from each other. So the benzene ring physically takes up a lot more space than the methyl group on the top. And the, on the bottom, the methyl group physically takes up a lot more space than a hydrogen. Okay, so we always favor the E? Yes, unless there's only one option. If it's our elimination reaction where we had two stereo centers next to each other, we only have one option for the stereo. And then it doesn't matter what, what the sterics are. It has to be what it has to be. Um, when we draw it out with the hydrogen facing 180 degrees from the chlorine, like we started today with, right? But nine times out of 10, probably nine and a half, 95 times out of 100, you're just going to put the biggest groups in the opposite direction from each other. Okay. And again, and that would be, I might put that, I might overrepresent that on a test or homework assignments because I want you guys to practice it. But mixing that up is like a minus, you know, half a point. If you got out of 10, if you got everything right, all your other stereoisomers were, were right, and then you just mixed up E versus Z on the complicated double chiral one, um, that'd be like a half a point or a maybe a one point, depending on how I wrote the problem, right? That's that's me pushing you guys to the very, very specific case at the end, getting the basics of what is an elimination reaction is much more important than getting hung up on that. Which I know everybody, everybody in this class is is used to getting um, good grades and feeling confident about, okay, I really understand this concept now. Um, but that's what 200 and, and higher level courses are like. Everybody's was good at the level before that, or you wouldn't be here now, right? So everybody's a little bit out of their depth. Um, maybe my personality type in high school and college lent myself doing well in those because I was used to like, I, get, I know it well enough for 90%. And I was satisfied with that. Um, I'm not telling you guys to get used to that. But like, don't feel like totally lost because there's one little detail that you can't quite wrap your head around, right? The main thing is what's a substitution, what's an elimination, and how do I tell first order from second order? So let's do another one of those. Is this gonna favor first order, second order, elimination, substitution? Second order, why? Primary chloride. And you've got a strong base here. 
anytime you've got an oxygen with a full negative charge, that's a pretty strong base. And same with nitrogens. If you have a nitrogen with a full negative charge or an oxygen with a full negative charge, um, that's a that's a pretty strong base. So our what we're going to favor second order for a couple reasons. We've got a strong base. It might also be a strong nucleophile, but let's not worry about that yet. And we've got a primary alkyl halide, which means that chloride is never going to leave on its own and leave a primary carbocation. It's just not going to happen. Maybe, maybe one time out of every hundred trillion molecules, you will see that happen. Right in the in the vein of everything that can happen does happen. It's going to be really really rare though. So in those, both of those things, the fact that we know it's a strong base, at least, if not also a strong nucleophile, and we have a primary alkyl halide, both favor second order. We don't even need to know anything about the solvent because of the, these two variables. They matter much more than the solvent. Now, if we want to decide elimination or substitution, we need to look at, is it a good nucleophile or is it a, is it a better nucleophile than a base or vice versa? Because a stronger base will favor elimination and a stronger nucleophile will favor substitution. And so if we go to the cheat sheet and look through here and try and find it, it's this compound here, right? It's drawn differently, but it's T-butyl alkoxide. T-butoxide is our, new, our base that we were looking at. And that's a T-butyl group with an oxide attached, which fits in the strong base weak nucleophile category. Not because it wouldn't attack a carbon if it had access to it, but because it has this big group attached to it, it can't get close enough to the carbon. All right, so it's still going to need to grab something to satisfy that oxygen's charge. So if it can't get to the carbon, it's gonna pull a hydrogen off from a beta carbon. All right, so this would, we call this a strong base. And bases favor elimination. If it's a better base than a nucleophile, it's going to favor elimination. Luckily, in this case, we're starting with a simple alkyl halide, right? Which means, do we need to worry about E and Z or more than one possible beta carbon? There is only one beta carbon, and there's no E and Z. So our product would just be propene plus the T-butyl alcohol. Our, our byproducts would be our T-butyl alcohol and our leaving group. So this problem only asks, does it favor elimination or substitution? Is it first or second order? But those are the same two questions that you should ask yourself on any of the, the reaction problems on this test. There's, there's gonna be a page of reactions. Um, usually the way I set it up is it's about 10 reactions. And each reaction is about four points. And so for each of these, those 10 reactions, some of them will be easy, some of them will be really complicated. All you need to do is give me the main product 
And the way you determine which mechanism to go through, if we only have these four mechanisms we're looking at, is you ask these two questions. Is it first order or is it second order? And then once you know that, you say, is it substitution or is it elimination? Rather than, I know that I started us out by draw everything and then figure it out. But if you're trying to go fast on a test and you have a limited amount of space, you don't want to figure everything out. You want to figure out what's the main mechanism and only draw that product or products if there's more than one. All right. So this is the way you should organize your thoughts. It's, is it first order or second order? And our main variable for that is, is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? Is our leaving group primary, secondary, or tertiary. And then does it favor elimination or substitution? We're looking at, is it a really good base or is it a really good nucleophile or both? So with this one, I'm just a little bit confused because I feel like we have two compounds here. And when you're talking about second or first or elimination or substitution, I'm just I'm still having a hard time which one, which of these compounds I should, just that. So when, when I'm talking about the primary, secondary, tertiary, I mean, which you're looking for the leaving group. You need to identify the, the functional group that's gonna be doing the reacting which okay. in this case with a, the limited number of reactions we know right now, the only functional group you're really looking for is where is my leaving group? Which is usually um, gonna be an alkyl halide. Okay, yeah, maybe it's, just, maybe it's just because the strong base is in like a skeletal structure and the other one is not written out completely. And that's part of the reason I did that is so that you had to think about that question. That's, you asked the question I wanted you guys to be thinking about here. Find your reactive groups on each molecule. On the left-hand side, it's your leaving group. On the right-hand molecule, it's that oxygen. That's your reactive functional group. And once you know that, you can say, okay, well, chlorides, are, all we know about chlorides is that they leave. So that's my leaving group. If we change the nucleophile, if we change the second molecule to hydroxide instead, is that gonna change whether we favor substitution or elimination? It's not gonna change first order or second order because that was dependent mostly on the fact we have a primary alkyl halide. If we change it to hydroxide, hydroxide is still a strong base, but it's also a strong nucleophile because it's small, right? It doesn't have that steric hindrance getting in the way. So if we change this to hydroxide, then we need to think about, okay, well, we're probably gonna get a mixture of products at this point because hydroxide is both a strong base and a strong nucleophile. If we look at our cheat sheet, hydroxide, strong nucleophile, strong base. It says preference for SN2 and E2. So again, still gonna be second order. So how do we know which, so we go, if we go up to our cheat sheet, we look at primary, Never SN1, never e E1, we already knew that. If we have a strong nucleophile, regardless of whether it's also a strong base, a strong nucleophile will favor substitution. Which means our product would now not, our major product would not be propene, it would be the substitution product, which is where we replace the chloride with the hydroxide. 
we substitute the chloride out and put the hydroxide in. Right, because a negative charge on this hydroxide is going to be attracted to any partial positive. If it pulls a hydrogen off, you get the elimination product. If it pulls, if it attaches to the carbon and the chloride leaves, you get the alcohol, the OH group added. All right, I know it's 950. I just want to say one thing about temperature. The reason that temperature plays a role here, and it's quick because you guys are primed for this. You guys are already used to thinking about delta G. If we're changing the temperature, what part of the equation is changing? The right side, the entropy, right? So high temperatures favor the side of the reaction that has more entropy. High temperatures favor having more entropy in your products. And elimination reactions, if we look at the elimination versus the, um, versus the substitution, substitution, we only got two products. We started with two molecules, the hydroxide and our halide, and we ended with two molecules. Elimination, we actually make a whole nother molecule because our leaving group leaves and our base steals a proton and we still have the, car the carbon that, that lost the leaving group. So we favor elimination at high temps because that is the, the pathway that gives us more entropy. High temperatures favors having more molecules. Right, so, and that's the big differentiation, especially if it's primary with a strong base that's also a strong nucleophile, the way we de decide whether we want substitution or elimination is we normally would say substitution unless it says plus heat. If it says plus heat, that's telling you Hey, we're putting it in conditions to favor elimination instead. All right. I know that was a lot of big abstract concepts and trying to apply them is tricky. Um, I will, I won't call, I told you guys you wouldn't have a quiz this weekend. And I'm going to stick to that, but I will put up a quiz that has zero points to it, just so that you can do some practice with this. Um, I would recommend doing that, and I, I won't. I will make the due date on Sunday like normal for our quizzes, so you have to come back in the next couple of days and think about this. But I know that you're mostly going to be working on reading your papers and that packet of NMR and IR stuff. But I don't want you to forget about this side too. So it's just there as a little reminder. Here's a little, and I'll make it short as well. Just a couple problems to think about this stuff again. Um, and other than that, watch the announcement that'll have details about our schedule for the week we get back. And um, actually, we'll do a quick poll real quick. Would you guys rather do your presentations on Thursday morning and and um, have less time for a review or would you rather do your, your journal article presentations Tuesday and leave Thursday's lecture just for review and practice? What would we be doing on Tuesday if we did our presentations on Thursday? We would do, be doing some practice here and then I'd be, you could use that as time to finish up your IR and NMR stuff in lab. Okay. Um, and ask questions. So it's, it's, just a question, would, would you rather review earlier and finish up on assignments on Tuesday, or would you rather get your research journal club done and have Thursday to work on just the test, basically, or practice test? Tuesday, Thursday, or all of it? Of, uh, reviewing stuff closer to the exam time. That, that was my initial thought. 
to do that. Um, we can we could potentially split them up if you if you are ready on Tuesday in lab. We'll do at least some of your presentations Tuesday in lab. And if you don't want to do your presentation Tuesday, you can do it Thursday instead. Um, and that way we can kind of split up the review time. You can get some review for IR and NMR on Tuesday and then some review for the test on Thursday and kind of give you guys, give you guys some flexibility there. Um, I, Cause I know some of you are gonna be ready to get the presentation done and out of your hair. So you don't have to think about it. And some of you guys are gonna want the extra two days. Okay, splitsies it is. Um, I'll, I will make the announcement so you can sign. I want you guys to sign up. Um, you don't have to sign up today, but by next Sunday, answer and say, okay, I wanna do my presentation Tuesday or Thursday. That way I can structure the time a little bit better. All right. All right. We are now five minutes over. So go on, get out of here. Have a good break. And uh, I'll see you guys in a, in a couple weeks. Thanks, Sean. Have a good break. You too. Have a good break, Sean. I guess. Hey, Sean, do you have a moment? I have just some concept questions. Or would you, um, you have uh, I, office hours? Uh, if you have time to come to office hours, I would prefer that just because I have a lab starting in four minutes. Yeah. For oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, come come back at, uh, at three. I'll be here. Okay. Thanks.